The Wall Street Journal fills its pages with over 10,000 numbers every day. Yet among all those numbers, we won't find the one that we as investors need the most, the long-term expected return of the stock market. I think it's the single most important number we need in organizing our financial lives. It's central in deciding how much to save and how to invest those savings. I want to share with you an easy way to compute that number for yourself, using a simple framework that most economists would agree with. Now, since our main concern as investors is the real inflation-adjusted value of our savings, we'll focus on inflation-adjusted returns. Normally, the further we try to gaze into the future, the greater the uncertainty. But a long-term view actually makes it easier to compute the expected return of equities. That's because using a long-term horizon means we can focus almost exclusively on cash flow rather than on future stock market valuation. For example, at a five-year horizon, 85% of our investment depends on valuation, whereas at a 50-year horizon, valuation influences only 20%. For equity investors, cash flow primarily means dividends. And if we know two things about dividends, their starting point and how they're likely to change over time, will be 90% of the way to our goal of estimating the long-term return of the stock market. I know some of you prefer to think about this question from the perspective of earnings and not dividends. I'll address that question in a future talk, but for now, let me assure you that we can get to roughly the same estimate whether we use dividends or earnings as our starting point. Now, let's take a closer look at the starting point, today's dividend yield. In addition to paying out dividends, it's become fashionable, particularly for U.S. companies, to pay out a lot of their cash flow in the form of stock buybacks, on the grounds that it's both tax efficient and is good for a company's share price. U.S. companies have been paying this shadow dividend through buybacks in huge size, averaging one and a half times the declared conventional dividend payment. That pace of buybacks may be unsustainable, but even if we assume that companies today would pay out a bit over 60% of their stated earnings as dividends, which is the long-term historical average, then the U.S. dividend yield would be 1% higher at 2.6%, and we'd have 3.2% for global equities. Next, how do we expect dividends to grow in the long run? The biggest driver of dividend growth is economic growth. And over the past 100 years, real U.S. growth was 3.4%. U.S. real dividend growth, however, was only 1.8%, which at first I found surprising, especially knowing that U.S. equities over the past 100 years delivered stellar returns, turning $1 million in 1900 into over $30 billion today. So why have dividends grown at roughly half the rate of growth in the economy? One reason is that private companies account for a lot of the growth in corporate earnings, and we don't get to invest in those private companies often until they're big and go public. Privately held businesses account for roughly half of U.S. corporate earnings. Another possible explanation is just that retained earnings are not quite enough to fund the investment needed to keep up with GDP growth. So that's it. We've got the main pieces we need to build our estimate. First, the starting dividend yield. 3.2% for global equities adjusted for U.S. buyback activity. Second, long-term real dividend growth. Let's use 1.5%, a bit less than what we've seen historically. As most would agree, many mature economies are facing big demographic headwinds and fiscal problems too. On the other hand, let's not forget that about 85% of us still live in developing economies, which should provide lots of growth potential. Finally, although it's not such a big factor given our long-term horizon, we do need to make an adjustment for the expected future valuation of the stock market. While sentiment and animal spirits are the main drivers of the ups and downs of the stock market in the short run, at a very long horizon, stock market valuation just doesn't matter that much. Let's assume the market today is about 10% more highly valued than it will be in the future which shaves just 0.2% per year off our long-term return estimate. So that's it. Just add those three numbers up and voila, 4.5%, 
our estimate for the long-term real expected return of the stock market. Of course, we can refine this number further and introduce risk into the discussion too, which I intend to do in future talks. But let's take stock of this 4.5% estimate, which I think is a really useful starting point. We are now equipped as investors with a simple but really valuable tool. Now you might say, what's the big deal? Our estimate of 4.5% is close to what we'd have come up with anyway, looking at the return of the stock market over the past 50 years. But there's a big difference in the confidence we should have in our forward-looking estimate as compared to a backward-looking one. Using the past 50-year stock market return as our estimate for the future is like trying to drive a car staring in the rearview mirror. And just assuming the market is efficient and that it will provide a fair and adequate return in the future is like trying to drive a car from inside a paper bag. Neither works out well. So does this three easy pieces approach give us an accurate estimate of the future return of the stock market? It's hard to say as we don't have thousands of years of data to test it against. But we can take a look at the two data points of history we do have. In 1915, our estimate would have been 7.9%. The outcome over the next 50 years was 8.2%. Not bad. In 1965, our 50-year estimate would have missed by 1.3%, a bigger miss, but still a lot better than if we'd used the previous 50-year return of 8.2% as our estimate. I'd say that's not too bad given all the dramatic events of the last 100 years. I suspect some of you are thinking, this is way too simple to be really useful. The first 20 years of my career in research and trading at Solomon Brothers and then LTCM taught me valuable, sometimes expensive lessons about complexity. Complex machines, when they're running smoothly, are impressive. But the greater the complexity, the greater the number of things that can go wrong. 700 years ago, the English monk, William of Ockham, put forward the proposition, known as Ockham's Razor, that the model with the fewest assumptions wins. When it comes to investing, my money's on the monk.